look, this is, there's 160, 70 people that showed up, so I, you know, I, I do think this is a process that people think have value, uh, and I'm prepared to respect that. Is, the, is it the perfect way of doing things? Probably not. Um, we, we have, is, it, this is one among many, and it's one that hasn't been done in a very long time. Uh, if every MP does their job right, they will be getting hundreds of items of input from uh, 338 ridings. So I think that's extremely important, and as you mentioned, it, it is an extremely important part of our democratic, pro democratic process. Uh, is there, a, is there will be a process of filtering that is done. It's done by my constituency office, which is uh, given what's gone on the last 10 years, is a very, very taxed uh, constituency office. Three, three people working uh, on a number of files that have been dropped for a long time. But they will, I've told them to put it an extreme amount of time on, on this process, as well as our pre-budgetary consultations, which frankly yielded very good results, and I would venture to say that our budget was adjusted incrementally accordingly. Um, uh, the recording, again, it's, it's a question of resources. You have, you have some here, um, but um, this isn't a, a panel review. This is a process where people are invited to give their input on things. So by its nature, it can be chaotic, but there's a lot of right people in this room, and we're trying to hear from them. So uh, I actually think it's a good thing. Yeah. Maybe go to the back. Hi, uh, my name is Josh Spencer. Um, I just wanted to say a point that someone raised earlier about incentives and disincentives. So, I found that uh, our educational and political system, as well as our media, failed to create a sense of urgency uh, necessary for people to change their individual behaviors and patterns of consumption. Um, so, if I think we need to create powerful financial and social incentives and disincentives, you know, move people away from damaging behaviors um, and towards modes of consumption that are at the least environmental impact possible. So, for example, we preach all we want about the ecological damage of. Um, buying and eating a bunch of beef, wherever it's come from Argentina or from Alberta or wherever else. Um, but what's really going to change people's minds is uh, how much that beef costs. So if that beef is twice the price it is today, people are going to be consuming less beef and hopefully other alternatives that are not as damaging. Um, so thus financial incentives, disincentives such as carbon tax are crucial to guiding our collective decision making and behavior within the, the system that we have. So I would really like to see some improvement and uh, action on that. I, th I think the nature of, 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 of people's skepticism, skepticism is, is a lot of the initiatives that governments can make are cautious and they're incremental, um, essentially because we, we represent a wide range of Canadians. We've undertaken to put a price on cargo. Uh, we've, bet we've undertaken to put $20 billion into so-called green infrastructure, which isn't necessarily the exciting stuff. It can be fixing what's going on in the canals, what's being put out in our wastewater. It can be a number of things that people don't off the top of their head think are exciting, but they're essential for, for the future of the city and, and for the future of this country. But it is incremental. There's people in this room that don't think it goes far enough, and there's people here that probably think it goes too far. So yes, and, and thank you for that. Because you can't forget that there is an offer and demand. There's a lot of these things that guide people Okay, I just want to ask those of you, try to keep, I know it's hiring, but if you can kind of keep your hand up a little bit so that we make sure that, you know, those that have had their hands up for a while have a chance. So, Bonjour, Bernard Bourget. Je suis membre des Coutards, mais je suis ici à titre personnel. Mais il y a des communautés peut-être très concrètes. Dans le dernier budget, le gouvernement a annoncé 120 milliards de dépenses sur 10 ans liées à des plans d'investissement pour des euh, mesures climatiques et environnementales. Et chaque année, le gouvernement dépense 300 milliards de dollars, dont 16 à 20 milliards d'achats. C'est le plus gros acheteur du gouvernement fédéral, le plus gros acheteur au Canada. Si les politiques d'achat incorporaient des règles liées aux à l'émission de gaz à effet de serre, des politiques liées à ça, ça créerait un effet d'entraînement pour créer des emplois et également stimuler l'innovation. Parce qu'avec ce, ce volume d'achat-là, on pourrait avoir des entreprises beaucoup plus concurrentielles, des prix qui ramèneraient les normes à la baisse du point de vue des gaz à effet de serre pour l'ensemble de l'industrie. Donc, le gouvernement devrait modifier, pas seulement les aspects liés au ministère de l'Environnement, mais l'ensemble des achats pour refléter ces priorités.
but there is a dialogue process if you're going over traditional land or lands with claims on them, and, and I agree with you on that. It isn't a question of, of trying to please everyone. In a democracy, you're not going to please everyone. But there is a consultation process. You can't run roughshod over them. So, thank you. Two things. One is the small, and one is the large. But I'm going to start with the small. Um, I think I was listening to the guy over here about making things more expensive. But what I see on the street is lots and lots of people you take, taking away, you know, like cup, plastic cups, you know, all the stuff in the, the takeaway places. Um, lots of meat being eaten, and and the effect of meat on on global uh, global emissions, right? So there's a whole industry out there that's driven by neoliberalism, and I want to talk about that because it's not being spoken about, uh, and, the, and the role of the ideology of neoliberalism on us, and how that's actually impacting on the way in which we behave, in fact, right? That's the first thing. The second thing that I'm really concerned about is that Justin Trudeau has said that he's going to be, um, um, he's going to deal with the Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabia to sell arms. Now, if, if war is not a big global polluter, and nobody talks about the pollution that war brings, and selling armaments is actually about more, more not only the, 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 the suffering of the human beings, but, but the terrible environmental impact. So, um, I, I know they're two very different things, but I'm very concerned about actually supporting a regime to send armaments that is going to go into war, which is going to cause, you know, anyway. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heidi Lund. I live in Point St. Charles, and I'm just a member of the general public. Um, I want to ask the federal government to take substantive measures and show real leadership. We saw some leadership in Paris, and I'd like Canada to take a role in showing other countries how it's actually possible to, to keep within those ambitious uh, Paris kind of uh, goals. So how do we get there? I think we need to re-envisage the economy, um, kind of building up actually on your point. I think we need to look uh, to build an economy that works for people, that works for First Nations, that works for women, that works for the poorest people in this country. So that means we need an economy that's locally and regionally based. It, it needs to be an economy that counts environmental externalities. It needs to be an economy that moves beyond conventional economics and isn't talking about growth of our GDP, but it's talking about well-being of our people. We need to... And so that means looking at a number of things, right? It means looking at food systems, it means looking at transit, it means looking at uh, energy systems, housing. Uh, and, and there are so many things I think that people in this room want to say, so I, I guess I, I can't say them all, but um, one thing that I, I think we can think about when we're looking at financing uh, these changes, I think we can talk about tax havens. Uh, so we have corporations in the country that, that are paying taxes, right? And they get a, this happens on a global scale, and it hurts everybody, actually, citizens of the world. So I think that's a concrete measure that the government could do to get more resources for public investments. Bravo! Bravo! Thank you, Heidi. There, um, the government, obviously, internationally, we can talk the talk, but as you said, we got we have to walk the walk, and, and there is a credibility gap that's widened over the last decade. Yeah. Uh, we need to rebuild our, our our credibility internationally. It's not going to happen over overnight. It's not going to happen by signing a treaty, as ambitious as it is. Um, how do we get there? Showing the world we're serious. Um, we took a number of undertakings. In fact, our prime minister was speaking in the G7 in Japan about public investment uh, in, in infrastructure, in investing in its people. Uh, the campaign focused on, on, on $60 billion of investments, uh, $20 billion in infrastructure, uh, bricks and mortar infrastructure, $20 billion on, 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 on environmental, and $20 billion on social infrastructure, which is housing, specifically what I said. Um, we have 
$400 million that we dedicated in our budget to fighting tax fraud. Uh, that's an amount that is historic, and it is going to go after those who cheat their fellow citizens. Um, there, uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, there is the public transit access aspect of it. But yes, I mean, we do need to take action. We need to show the world we're serious, and we need to do through concrete actions. Again, it's not going to happen in the next few weeks, but hopefully over the next the course of this term, uh, you will see significant difference in our attitude and money where our mouth is. Thanks, guys. Hello, I think I have the microphone. Uh, my name is Frederick Kronosh. I'm an international environmental lawyer. So I have a really specific proposal. Um, as you're probably aware, the environmental assemblies are taking place right now. And the Global Environmental Outlook 6 regional assessments have just said that uh, environmental change is happening faster than we even expected. And uh, that there's really we're in a dire situation where it's like taking action now, which it just comes, you know, about two days ago. Um, the G7 and the G20 have all committed to eliminating subsidies on production uh, and the use uh, and refining of fossil fuels. Canada's spending several tens of billions of dollars a year subsidizing the oil and gas industry primarily through tax and other economic incentives. This is money that could be used to be funding a green transition. We don't need to be running these deficits. Many of these incentives are actually for uh, oil and gas exploration, which suggests that we still need to be out there destroying the boreal forest uh, and drilling and exploring for new oil and gas beyond what we've already found, which is tremendous. So I don't know that that's really a place where the government and public funds should be spent. Uh, rather than on, on funding, you know, the projects under new laws that are trying to propel Canada to a more green economy. Mon nom est Louise Morin, je suis membre du comité vigilance de l'Ontario de Québec. Euh, pour euh, Réussir à, à, à diminuer, à sauvegarder le climat, une des premières choses que le gouvernement devrait s'engager à faire, c'est d'arrêter de euh, « cheating with science », reconnaître les faits tels qu'ils sont. Au bureau des, des audiences publiques en environnement, on a vu le calcul qui était fait par le ministère de l'Environnement fédéral pour calculer les gaz à effet de serre en amont du pipeline énergie est et les gaz à effet de serre qui sont émis par le gaz utilisé pour chauffer le bitume ne sont pas pris en compte dans le calcul. Il n'y a pas d'analyse de cycle de vie des, euh, de, de, du carbone, des, des produits du gaz. Alors, c'est incommensurable un, un tel déni, finalement, de la réalité des gaz à effet de serre émis et euh, ne pas se, de se contenter uniquement d'une portion des gaz émis en amont et de ne pas vouloir voir les gaz en aval que ce pétrole-là devra être euh, brûlé. Donc, se fier sur la vraie science, et la vraie science nous dit que jusqu'à 95% du pétrole des sorts bitumineux doit rester dans le sol. Alors, en fait, Canada sont en train d'accélérer le gouvernement des États-Unis pour 15 milliards de dollars euh, parce qu'ils ont cancelé Keystone Excel. Ils font ça sous, sous NAFTA. Alors, moi, mon commentaire, c'est si vous signez des traités de libre-échange tels la TPP qui s'en vient, euh, on peut faire autant de parlement qu'on veut. But we'll be giving our power away to corporations. Where... Corporations are not people, and if we sign these trade agreements, everything else is going to be cosmetic because they're going to erode our power from underneath. Uh, I have done a very good job, and I'm 
just want to comment that at the beginning of this, your presentation said we are starting to accept, you know, everyone knows what the science is. Well, the science says that within the next hundred years or more, our, our civilization is done if we don't change things. So when we say, oh, we're the fifth biggest pr producer of oil, so we have to take our economy into account, we also have to take our lives into account and the lives of our descendants. It's that serious. Thank you. I, I don't want to be a geek on trade agreements, uh, far from it, but uh, I think you're getting at a very specific point uh, that may have been distorted perhaps by the statement, but it isn't an invalid one. In fact, it's quite valid. Uh, these trade agreements give corporations the right to sue where they feel they've been uh, improperly treated vis-a-vis -vis how people in a domestic system would have been treated. Uh, so they can say they've been expropriated if X, Y, or Z has happened, and in this case, uh, a cancellation of a pipeline. So they, they, what you're saying is it takes the power. If it's done on an environmental basis, what you're saying, I guess, is, is that this, this shouldn't happen, and it's stripping the government from, the, from, from its ability to take decisions. This decision, Typically in those trade agreements, these provisions more often than not are good because it levels the playing field. Not true. What it, does, what it does is it levels, but this is, you can have your arguments on the environmental front, but when you're in an international trade system and, an and a foreign partner is being improperly treated, when Canadians go abroad and they're properly treated, they have no matter of recourse other than petitioning their own government to intervene, and what that does is creates protectionism. And spikes prices. Nothing and, wrong with and that. Demand really elsewhere. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you necessarily, but on the environmental front, a lot of the criticism has come specifically from that is that a lot of corporations are using uh, an environmental decision making process and then it creates a huge lawsuit for which they're liable. It allows them to protect themselves, but it takes exactly. away our power to protect yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I really don't want to take away from that conversation. I hate to kind of shift things to a different way, but at this rate, it looks like we're going to have to adapt to a lot of the realities due to climate change, um, and one of those are a um, huge influx of, um, of migration because of it. Um, I hope that towards the end of tonight, you see how like intersectional sustainability issues are and how um, climate change is affecting not just uh, you know, oil companies and fossil fuels and maybe food. It's affecting everything. Um, so, what was your name? Lana. I'm actually the sustainability coordinator of the CSU, uh, the Concordia Student Union. Um, so I'm concerned with um, how in terms of migration policy we'll adapt um, to what will be a large influx of people coming here from places facing either drought or flooding, depending on where they are. Um, and as some of the acting culprits of the causes of climate change, it's our responsibility to accommodate those who must leave their homes because of it. Um, so we need, to, we need to be able to support them and also make sure that they don't have to move again because of these external forces. Um, I think it's an important aspect of it, adapting to what the inevitable is. Um, so yeah, I really hope that migration policy is opened up a little bit more. Well, a lot more. Amanda, thank you. One, it isn't uh, droughts do cause migration problems, and everyone knows what droughts are caused by. It is a significant, a significant spike in in uh, the impact of climate-based migration, climate-based crisis in the last uh, decade, two decades. Um, a lot of what we, a lot of the flare-ups in the Middle East um, have droughts uh, in part as one of the causes. Uh, this isn't lost on our Minister of Foreign Affairs. In fact, he said quite specifically that water rights, uh, access to food that doesn't, uh, stable food, food security, um, is uh, an important point in the, in the next round of, of discussions and, and thinking over how we interact with our neighbors, particularly as we discuss migration, climate change, and access to food, and how this impacts uh, governments. And so that isn't lost. In, in, Climate is, has to be part of that discussion because it is one of the causes and the, it's, it's tangible. So I appreciate you for, for bringing that up. And if, if there's at least two, two uh, speeches by our Minister of Foreign Affairs that essentially underline what you highlighted. So thank you.
And good evening, uh, Mark. I'd like to thank you and your staff for this opportunity this evening. I have two brief points I want to bring out. One, as we all watched over the past month, in Alberta burning, watching an industry basically have to shut down and listening to the economic impact. We have to understand one thing, even though we do, everybody's point here is very valid, we do have to transition to a new economy, to a new reality. But the key word is transition, and that takes time. If we all, even if we had electric cars at $20,000 today, the average person can't afford to go out and buy a new car immediately. So consequently, any, all of this is going to take transition. And we can't just turn off one industry when there is no industry there to replace it. So consequently, what we need are best practices, and we need to evolve into best practices. We 